Welcome to Scrubcast, where we take a closer look at the research happening at Stanford University's Department of Surgery. I'm your host, Rachel Baker. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Brooke Gerland. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hey, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Dr. Gerland is a clinical professor in our Division of General Surgery's colorectal section. What is your colorectal surgery origin story? <laughs> well, <laughs> great question. So, you know, you start in general surgery in many cases, and then you kind of branch out once you're in general. And I've been practicing for about 24, 25 years. And yeah, I've been here for a while. <laughs> And um, I, you know, really just, I basically love the operating room. And then once you know that you love the operating room for anybody who's just considering what they want to go into it, then you kind of narrow it down to kind of upper versus lower. And one of the, the um, fun things about colorectal surgery is that there's a large diversity. You know, you could be, do big abdominal cases. You could choose to focus on cancer. You can also do a lot of anal rectal conditions, colorectal talks all about function, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, one thing is the anatomy, but like how people are dealing with their bowel habits, which, you know, people love to talk about they're on vacation. That's, that's what comes up. <laughs> one of my favorite books when I was little, everybody poops. Exactly. Exactly. So colorectal surgery is fun. You can do endoscopy. So there's a lot of diversity. Awesome. Well, so you specialize in rectal prolapse, which apparently is not a homogenous diagnosis. There are different subtypes. So, right. I do a lot within colorectal, but I've kind of made my niche in this uh, idea about prolapse and also multi-compartment prolapse, which means that it can just happen to the rectum, but it can also happen to the other organs. And primarily we're discussing women and we're talking about pelvic organ prolapse and urinary incontinence. And actually in the world of rectal prolapse, about 90% affected are women and about 10% men. Wow. And so that's what I've made my area of, you know, kind of outcomes research and learning more about it and surgical techniques and education. Although I do many things, that's where I like to kind of stay focused in the research arena. Any idea why so many more women than men? So there's two kind of main areas we think about. One is a young group who hasn't had any childbirth. And the other is a group of women who are more around the perimenopausal period, more common like after 50s. And that is usually more related to a sort of childbirth injury. So in the younger group, we think more along the lines of like hyperreflexia, which is those hypermobility kind of disorders, alos, danlos, something related to connective tissue disorders. And that's kind of a branching out uh, and probably even being too specific with EDS, we call them hypermobility. It can also be a lot of chronic straining in the younger group, some eating disorders, and we know that there's trauma can also be related. And then in the, in the older group, we blame a lot on childbirth, but there are probably other things that also are adding to weakening the pelvic floor and then some lifestyle things that one could work on. Okay. I didn't know that I had a pelvic floor until I took yoga. Uh -huh. What is, what is my pelvic floor? Where did this I decide? Yeah, yeah, a Bondi kind of thing in yoga. <laughs> is that where you have to pull in? And now, so like, <laughs> I like to if you give an example of like a paper bag or a shopping bag, right? Mm -hmm. So that in a shopping bag, there's something on the bottom of that shopping bag that has to support. And sort of, if you think of it that way, there's a series of pelvic muscles and nerves, and they will support the organs that then come through. And if you do them in sort of a sequential order from front to back, you're talking about, you know, the urethra that helps you urinate, the vaginal, the vaginas in that middle compartment, and then in the posterior, the behind compartment is the rectum. But it's the same muscles and the same nerves, and they are subject to different degrees of injury. So if those muscles are too tight, and when I say too tight, I mean like let's say you're a type A person and you're like all the time, you never relax. Then you could have problems urinating, defecating, you can have pain that's associated. Or if you're someone, let's say you've had some sort of injury or childbirth, you could have had radiation, surgery, but that area is loose, those pelvic muscles are weaker, or as we age, we know that muscles become weaker. So in anything, if things are too loose, then that can lead to any kind of incontinence. Okay, so say I'm too loose or whatever. Um, <laughs> can you help me? 
what do I do? Yeah, so that's where <laughs> that's where um, pelvic floor exercises can come in to play. That's why it's so important for all individuals as they age to be very active right? To do a lot of walking. And there's a lot of data on that as far as lifestyle. We don't tend to think of how that interplays with the pelvic floor, but it certainly does. And in the older population, there's a relationship between nursing home admission and incontinence rates. And some of it may be like, as you're become incontinent, it's harder for your family to take care of you. But it's the same thing. If you can't get up from a chair, you're not mobile, you can't get to the bathroom, all of those things that lower pelvic, you're not using those areas, then it becomes harder and harder to like to get around and take care of your own lifestyle. So I know we jumped around a lot, Rachel, about the younger, the older, the pelvic floor, but those kind of those things all interplay. Got it. Okay. So taking care of my pelvic floor, but let's say the worst happens and I end up with a prolapse. What are is, is surgery? So is that where um, you come in? Yeah. So if in the world of rectal prolapse, there can be like internal rectal prolapse, external rectal prolapse. And then it depends on what the symptom is, like what it is that's bothering you. This is a quality of life issue. It's not life threatening. It doesn't have to be taken care of, but in most people, we're going to recommend it and say yes, because if you have a significant prolapse, that means that something is hanging out. It's loitering. It's loitering. Yeah. It's coming out of the anal muscles opposed to you could have the rectum bulging into the vagina. And we call that a rectocele where it's almost like pockets because of the direction of forces. That's actually a pretty normal finding only when it becomes larger than a certain size that we think about it. But when I think about of true rectal prolapse, I think of it coming towards the anal muscles or out of the anal muscles. And the reason that we do want to treat it in people who are healthy enough who want to have it treated is because over the long term, it can stretch the anal muscles, it can put traction on the pelvic floor and cause nerve injury. And so even if you start out and your function is good and it only comes out intermittently, over time, if it constantly coming out, it can make the function of the bowel. That would mean either difficulty getting the stool out or making it so that you leak stool. So we want to avoid that happening long term. Absolutely. So then yes, surgery. Yes, that's where I come in as a colorectal surgeon. That's where I say, oh, let's, let me make sure you don't have what I call multi-compartment prolapse, that the, the vagina, the bladder, all that is intact because we want to make sure that we've evaluated the whole pelvic floor. And then yeah, surgery if people are interested. But there are exercises and things that can be done first. Always believe in optimization. Optimization means that your diet is right and your exercise is right and you're doing all those lifestyle things. What kind of operation do you do? Is this like a laparoscopic procedure or is it open? Robotic? Yeah, so I think we've moved it towards the world of trying to avoid open in most individuals unless there is a reason why they can't have a minimally invasive procedure. Okay. So the answer is yes to minimally invasive, which is either robotic or laparoscopic. And I tend to do most of my cases robotically. Hmm. One of the operations involves a lot of sewing low down in the pelvis. That's where you really get the advantages of the robot because mm-hmm. it really allows you that wristed movement and very easy to sew there. Awesome. All right. Well, so um, one of the things that actually I think I know you best for is your interest in video. One of the things that you sent to me was this animated video for patient education. How did you come up with the idea of creating an animation and why a video for patient education? I'm, of course, interested in how patients do and their outcomes and the individual, but those that getting those kinds of numbers takes really long time period. One year is not enough, maybe five years following people up. And, and we're doing all of those things. So just so you know, like in the back burner here, <laughs> we're constantly capturing outcomes and trying to do larger center things, but they take a long time. Yep. And then what I started to think about is like, okay, well, this is what I want to know. Like, these are things I want to know, but like, how can I? really help the patient? How can I make it easier for them to understand what's going on? And we just live in a world of video now. We live in a world of short videos. Mm -hmm. I'm super interested in how to facilitate that communication 
Um, there's so many different kind of learners and visually we see things differently. Like even, uh, I don't know, five years ago, Rachel, don't you think that we create our content differently now Absolutely. than we did before? And that's where I became interested. It was like a beyond what I could do with my own video. And really I actually, Stanford Video has been involved with helping me create some of them. And my first videos were more along the lines of explaining to patients what their anatomy was like. And I have two, one is uh, showing me um, an internal prolapse, external prolapse and the defecation. And then there's another one that talks about what we call dyspnergic or difficult evacuation. Hmm. And so we spend a lot of time on those first two. And ultimately we have in the works now that we'll be live at some point. Video making is kind of like renovating a home. It just always takes longer than you think. Always. <laughs> always, always. Yeah, so... Um, that we're going to do one on the surgical technique. So our next one will be all specifically about surgery. But we started about just teaching people about their anatomy, why they have what they have, um, because the health literacy, even in very educated people, is very low. Like you didn't know you had a pelvic floor until yeah. yoga and we don't know what that pelvic floor does. And when we don't understand what's happening with our bodies, it's a source of anxiety. Mm-hmm. You know, Absolutely. what is normal? What is no not normal? What, and sometimes I feel like my job is just explaining to people what's happening on the inside. Mm -hmm. I can't necessarily fix everything. And some things you just have to fix on your own, but you have to be able to relax and accept and, you know, many things you have to work on by yourself <laughs> is what it comes down to. And do you find that the patients are responding to these videos? I think so. I hope so. So in one of the studies that I think I sent to you that we recently got published, we did kind of a focus group. That's how I looked at it. We sent the video out to a lot of the patients who already were participating in my registry, and we gave them the opportunity to do a one-on-one -on -one video, and then we did some qualitative analysis. And that's where I said, like, I can develop content, but that isn't necessarily content that patients want to see. So I spent a lot of time sending it out to women of different age groups to making sure that I capturing like what they want. And then when we did this subsequent video, we implemented some of those changes. And now when I go to do the surgery video, I'll do that. But really like people have to tell me what resonates with them. You yeah. want to hear something that was interesting? Um, someone commented on my voice or my narration and I know I have to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. I know. But yes, I want to develop things that patients want to hear. And that's why we did a lot in um, different translations. So we yeah. translated it into Chinese, into Korean, Portuguese, Spanish, Arabic, and I would keep translating it. I think women with this problem need to see the content in the language they're comfortable with. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, so it's funny, you said that you are a person who loves to operate. So it is always a little surprising to me when people who love to operate take leadership positions because I think that takes them away from the OR. You are chair of the Pelvic Floor Disorders Consortium, which is part of the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons. And you've been working on creating a research agenda for like the next five to 10 years, which is a massive undertaking. I don't even know where do you begin on something like that? I know, right? <laughs> Like super amorphous. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's been a great time working on this committee. Like it's part of the pelvic floor committee. And then the consortium was sort of a natural movement. And we created a number of projects, especially around rectal prolapse. We've done a lot of publications. And then I said, whoa, 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 let's now we've, we've like thrown out all these tentacles. We've done all these projects. And I mean, international, you know, I have surgeons all over. We're looking at time zones. Last year was pelvic floor physical therapy with work group and everybody would work together on their own. And then they would come together at the end of the year at the national meeting. And then we would vote. What do we think is important? What isn't? And we've got publications coming up. So what we did with this project is we did it as a four round Delphi. And that meant that the first round was I sent out to this very large volunteer group. What do you think are the things that we should focus on? Where do you see this going? And then they sent me back all of these um, topics. I then put them into themes. We categorized them, and then we sent out a three round Delphi until we narrowed things down at the meeting itself. 
we then voted on the ones that were in intermediate consensus. Like if it made high consensus, then we said, okay, well, that's great. We leave it. But if it was intermediate consensus, we then revoted on it. And then we came up with taking the consensus statements and then saying, how do we actualize these into projects? And the other next big piece of it, and we have that also like on the website, is we created a survey for patients. So we took all the topics. It's not just surgeons, by the way. It's pelvic floor physical therapists and urogynecologists and anybody who works in the space, radiologists, GI. And so we said, okay, these are the ones that the clinicians were interested in. Now you as patients tell us what you are interested in. So actually our IRB is only for the United States and I've had a number of sites that are translating a site in Brazil or waiting for their IRB. So we're gonna also look at it, not just as all patients and English speaking patients, but patients in different countries. Does everybody wanna know the same thing or do they want us to focus on other things? And I feel like that will be super helpful when we are requesting grant money or we're trying to organize ourselves. And then it, it kind of gives us like, hey, we asked all these questions, we looked at it, and now this is the direction that we need mm -hmm. to go in. Awesome. I love that. Uh, well, so we are at the point in each episode of Scrubcast where we ask our guests the two same questions. And the first one is, who is a surgeon you admire and why? I most recently came back from a retirement party of one of my real mentors, Tracy Hull. She actually won a mentor award at the ASCRS. And prior to me being at Stanford, I was at the Cleveland Clinic and she was one of my partners. And she's just a huge role model. You know, she's fantastic. Like the women group that are about 10 years, maybe 15 ahead of me, they really paved the way for ease of women in the fields of colorectal. So I'm super excited to see what she's going to do next, because that's how I'm going to model what my retirement looks like. <laughs> awesome. Uh, the second question is the best advice you have received in 10 words or fewer. I think the best advice is when we talk about this idea of mindfulness and mm -hmm. just working on one thing at a time. And I know we like have all these lists and all these things that we have to do. And I think that makes us a little bit crazy. And I think when I have a day like I'm doing this podcast, like this may be the only thing I'm going to do today. No, I'm <laughs> I've already done a number of things. But, but instead of me trying to do everything all at once, it's just, okay, I'm allotting a time. This is what I'm working on. I'm not trying to answer a million phone calls. I'm not trying to check email. I really moved away from the, that concept of, look what a great multitasker I am. I can do everything. That is not fun for me. I think it, we really should move towards one project at a time. You're eating lunch. Just eat lunch. Just eat lunch. Yeah. yeah. Be present. Enjoy. Savor your food. Yeah. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. But before we go, I want to ask, what is next for Dr. Gerland? Oh, I don't know. You know, there's so many projects that I have to wrap up and do. <laughs> Actually, the next thing that I'm looking forward to in February, which I think, Rachel, you would be interested in, is I'm taking culinary medicine class in Napa. Ooh, awesome. Yeah. That'll be so much fun. I can't wait to hear more about yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Take care. Okay. You too. Bye. And that brings us to the end of another episode. If you like Scrubcast, we hope you'll tell your friends and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Scrubcast is a production of Stanford University's Department of Surgery. Today's episode was produced by Rachel Baker. The music is by Midnight Rounds. And our chair is Dr. Mary Hahn.